Hey, Untold Radio Network fans. Want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. Hesitation coming around again. Termination, more than we might have been. Content is for entertainment only. Listener discretion and responsibility apply. The network is not liable for listener actions or consequences. Hello, 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 my friends in Sasquatch land. Monday night once again and Discover Sasquatch is back in the Untold Radio Network studio. I am the OG Chris Reinhardt and I will be your host for this show that we have for you tonight. And what a show do we have? Mr. Greg House is backstage at the moment, fresh off of the big LBL outing. And we're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, Greg is a uh, a one of a kind guest. He's got so much experience with the Sasquatch and interactions with the Sasquatch and helping others with the Sasquatch. Uh, he's an all around good guy, and he's I call him one of the good guys of Sasquatch for sure. Um, so we're very happy to have him here. Um, I'd just like to say hello to everybody in the chat before we get started. The Squatch Father himself is with us, Mr. Alfred Santariga. Boots on the ground with Barb is with us tonight. Hello. BF Bud is with us. He's fresh off LBL. Mr. David Hughes. Hello. Mr. Patrick Nobel. Hello, Mr. Patrick Nobel. It's the Squatch and Holler is with us tonight. Phyllis, Phyllis Boucher Perry. I hope I said that correctly. Um, good evening. Miss Diane Fowler is with us. Everybody's pouring in. Flat Rock is here. Um, Mr. David Blalack is here. How was your trip back to Oregon, my friend? Hope you made it safe and safe and secure. Richard Jr. is with us. So everybody's pouring in to see this show tonight, and I would be right alongside with you guys. Um, I was just talking to Greg backstage. Uh, I wasn't too sure that we were going to have him on the show tonight. Um, we had a, he he fell asleep a little bit. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell people that, but he fell asleep at the man cave, and uh, we couldn't get a hold of him. And uh, finally, it all hooked up, and he's backstage, and we're happy to have him. So welcome everybody. Miss Jeff Yer Jeff Yarrington's with us. David Hughes. If I miss anybody, Mr. Spencer Jameson's with us. If I miss anybody, and I didn't forget to say hello. It's. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to say hello to everybody that's here. So let's get this show on the road. Without further ado, one of the good guys in Sasquatch, Mr. Greg House. Man, I'm always amazed at the folks that turn out to listen to me talk. Man, that oh, man. they're just pouring in, my friend. Got so many awesome friends and how you look extended family right there in that chat. All right, all right. So I want to say first of all, thank you for taking the time out of today, especially of all days after a weekend that you guys all just had and driving back. And I just want to say a big thanks for taking time and uh stopping here tonight and uh sharing a little bit with everybody. Man, I'm I'm just proud to be here. And I uh you guys uh 
what Chris told you, I was sitting here waiting. I'd done talk to Spencer and Misty and Roger earlier. And I said, Hey, y'all, I got to go on with Chris tonight. And I'll be on a little bit and I'll be dang, I dozed off. And I woke up about 20 minutes ago and I thought, Oh no, I'm staring at the clock going, Oh, I got to get on, the, get on the line. So I made it. Grace the good Lord. I guess he woke me up. Uh, yeah, everything, everything worked out. Everything worked out. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, every most, you know, people know who, who you are and what you're all about, but there are, there's probably a couple out in the audience that don't know. And, you know, new listeners or whatnot, uh, don't know who Greg house is. You want to just fill them in a little bit, a little tiny bio, if you could, please. Well, I mean, guys, I'll, Hey, look this Thursday, the April 11th, I'll be 50. Uh, turn the big five O's. So I'm officially old now. Uh, I live north northwest Alabama. Lived here all my life. A little small town. Got a middle of nowhere. I live uh, property where I'm sitting right here. If I open this door and go outside and throw a rock, I'm, I can hit a national forest boundary. I mean, I, my land joins a, a big national forest here. Um, lived here. Just grew up. I mean, hunting and fishing. Grew up in the woods. Uh, my mom and dad had a farm. We had poultry houses. We raised cattle. Dad was a commercial fisherman. We we done all kind of stuff to put food on the table. I mean, uh, just just grew up. I've got three three siblings, two brothers older and one younger. Been married, y'all, nearly twenty eight years. Got two children, uh, wonderful, glorious children. Uh, my son's fixing to turn eighteen. And my baby girl's birthday is the same day mine is. She'll turn 12 for the day I turn 50. And uh, so, yeah, we just, you know, just I've been blessed, y'all. I've got just just had a wonderful, wonderful existence, I guess. Uh, just just grew up small town, small town, Alabama. Oh, uh, nice. well, happy been, birthday. Happy birthday and early birthday to you and your daughter. Thank you. And y'all, I'm, I'm a small business owner. I, I work for myself as well. I pay the bills and. I've also been a, uh, I still am. I haven't been able to do a lot since I had my ankle replaced and been down with it. But I've been a peace officer for going on 16 years and I'm still sworn officer. So um, a local fire department, I, I'm one of the officers in our fire department, do rescue squad, uh, search and rescue in this big national forest. Man, I've hiked in. I think the furthest I've ever had to hike in to, to get somebody that was lost in this forest we hiked in the time we went in and out and got this lady. It was about 23, 24 miles to go get her. So yeah, I've done a lot of stomping in the woods in my lifetime. Of course, oh. avid, avid deer hunter. I don't see the walls. There's probably 80, 80 sets of horns hanging up in my, my cabin here on the lake. So that's a little bit about me. Well, well, God bless you for everything you do. And, uh, it takes a lot for you to go out and risk your own life for others. And, uh, I'll just say thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, so, uh, what, what? How did you get bit by the the Bigfoot bug? I mean, you you know how it takes over. How, how did you get bit by that bug? What 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 got you into the Bigfoot scene? Man, it was it was it was absolutely accidental. Oh, uh, I, I mean, I was twenty six or so years old. Well, yeah, about twenty six because it was about two thousand. Oh, uh, it was sheer accident. I mean, I, I didn't go out looking for these things. I wasn't trying to find them. They found me. Uh, me and my dad developed a piece of property, or say developed it. Uh, my cousin owned 40 acres, exactly, pretty much crow fly a mile from where I'm sitting. We took a little 40-acre parcel of land surrounded by several thousand acres of forestry service land, government government land, open to the public. My cousin owned some, a parcel in there that, that joined the, the bank water. And uh, it was all grown up. It had been logged several years, and it just grew up volunteer. And we uh, carried his bulldozer over there, and I built some roads or opened up the old roads that went in that property. It just made a big loop pretty much around the 40 acres. We built two green fields, and we developed them to hunt on. And uh, the very first, the very first uh, day of both season that year, I was hunting the field and dad was hunting the other field and I had something come in that I couldn't explain because right at dark, I had uh, something went to knock in the tree. I had three hard wood knocks just out of the end of the field from me. The field was about 80 yards long and this was within 20 yards of the field. So a hundred yards from me, I've got something that sounds like Babe Ruth shattering a wooden ball bat. 
and it's hitting a hard a hard tree like a beech tree because it was sounded like it was a tight bark like a smooth real crisp bark but it was just three tree knocks and i hear it just kapow 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 and i thought it was somebody messing with me i mean i, I thought it was somebody mad because we had got that land developed it and we're hunting it and they was trying to mess up my hunt so i came down came out and I asked dad when he came out of the woods, I said, you see anything? He said, no, I didn't see anything. Did you? I said, no. He said, well, I knew you wouldn't. He said, what were you beating on down there? You wasn't going to see anything. I said, oh, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. I said, somebody's in here. This is a dead end road a mile long. I said, I don't know who it was, but I'm fixing to find out. I said, undoubtedly, they parked on down where the road went on down about a quarter of a mile past us. So I got in my truck, me being a guy kind of pretty big old redneck boy. I'm going to go figure out who's messing with me. We get in the truck and drive down. There's no vehicle. There's, there's no other way out. It's a dead end road. If they was in there, they had to walk, they had to come out by me. Couldn't figure out what was going on. And then it just started escalating for there. And we, uh, we started dealing with these things and we just, and really I was in the dark for, for a long time. I mean, for at least a couple of years, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We just knew we had a lot of strange things happening. And, and honestly, I mean, Bigfoot was, that was a long way from going in my head of this is what's going on. And then it, we started having more happenings and, and things and I start trying to figure it out. And it started kind of puzzle pieces going into place of what we were dealing with. And even though I was having all these encounters, it would coincide with other people's reports. And I started leaning that way. I still couldn't believe it. You know, I, like I said, you know, I thought it, I'm kind of like a lot of people here in the Southeast. I thought, I'm kind of open to the fact that there is such a thing as a Bigfoot, but it's not here. You know, that thing's in Colorado, Wyoming, or, you know, Pacific Northwest. It's not here where I'm at. And then, man, it just, you know, it just kept escalating and escalating. And I tell people the first year, they just kind of let us know they were there. We were having a lot of whoop. You'd hear in the evenings before dark, you'd either hear in tree knocks or whoops, like W-H-O-O-P. And, and it would just whoop. And I'm trying to figure out what's doing this because it's way too long. It's way too loud to be any kind of bird. I've never heard anything like that. And dude, I'd hear, I'd have these things. They may sound like they're 500 yards away and whoop, or I've had them. They'd be in the thicket. They wouldn't be 20 yards. Man, it would hurt your ears when they would even whoop. They're beating trees and that, and we'd hear, we'd hear whistles. It'd be a, a monotone whistle. It'd be really loud. And we're trying to figure out what is this making this whistle? Well, we put up with that. That's pretty much kind of the blanket coverage of the first year. And we heard this a lot. Now, I mean, dozens of times the first year. And it would be, like I said, sometimes up close, sometimes far away. And a lot of times when they would, they would knock on the trees, it would be, you'd have three knocks. And then somewhere in the distance, within just a few seconds, you would get an answer and it would be two knocks. So it would knock with three and most time it would answer with two. And that was just, it kept correlating that way. And that kind of summed the first year. But now the second year, we kept going back to the property. We, we changed a little bit of stuff and got opened up and, uh, you know, cleared out a little bit more. And these things wasn't real happy that we came back. I, I don't know if they thought they ran us off after the season went out or what. But the next year, it escalated on the encounters and, and the interaction because they got to where then they would, they, would, they would follow you out of the woods. They didn't really chase us that second year. But, yeah, they would, they would pace you out. And sometimes these things, you'd hear them coming from a long way off. Sometimes it was just like they just was, were there. And I couldn't figure out, like, well, was this thing up here close when I got in the stand? And I've sat here for three and a half hours, and it just didn't move? Or how did it get, like, it's, it's had to sneak up on me, and it would be in this grown up overgrown thicket that you, it's just like looking through this wall. You couldn't see an arm's length into this stuff because it was just bushes, just, just woven up saplings. All that stuff was about, you know, this big around and it was pines and hardwoods and, and vines and briars and just, just a jungle. But these things, I would hear them, you know, the deer going through it had like little tunnels and holes and they could travel. But I'm hearing an animal that sounds the size of a, you know, like a full grown bull and it's breaking saplings like this big around as it's traveling. But sometimes those things, they would move and you, or I say move, you would hear them coming. And it's making all this racket, crunching stuff and breaking stuff. And then sometimes it would be like, it's just there. I mean, it, it, it's close. It's 20 yards, but I never heard it come up. 
So I don't know if it was there waiting when I got there and waited till closer to dark to make itself known. But dude, I'd climb out of the stand and they, they would pace you. When you'd walk, they'd walk. When you'd stop, they'd stop. Well, we were still hearing the, the tree knocks and the whoops and the howls and the whistles. And they got to where they would, what I call a huff grunt. They would, they would huff at us and they would grunt and then they would growl. And then by the next year, it's getting worse and worse. And then by the next year, it's more than that. Well, then it's getting to where they're bluff charging us. They got to where they would steal. Like when I would shoot a deer, I couldn't leave a deer that I shot in this green field. It's about 200 yards from the field out to where I parked. And you couldn't see it because the road kind of went out and it curved and it, it went to where we would park. Dude, I, I've shot deer and I don't mean I shot one and I bloodied it up. And we had a blood trail and I just couldn't find it. No, no. Uh, we had a few of those too, because anybody that deer hunts, it doesn't matter how great a shot you make. Sometimes that deer's running on pure adrenaline, and I call it running dead. You shoot one, knock it down, the thing jump up and run. It may run 50 yards. It may run 200 yards with its heart exploding. And you'll have a massive blood trail, and you'll find a big puddle of blood, and then there's your deer. But you still got to do some tracking. I'm not talking about that. Hey, I found a blood trail, and we couldn't find it. No. I'm talking about six deer in now about 11 or 12 years that I would shoot the deer climb out of the stand, walk myself to the deer, lay hands on it. This deer's not breathing. It's got a, a hole blowed through it, both sides, through the sh front shoulders, the lungs. I've had, I had a deer that had pieces of lung tissue big as my pinky finger blow down on the ground. The deer jumped up and before I could put another shot in it, it got in a thicket. I climbed down, walk like 175 yards, get there, there's blood everywhere. I step over about probably 30 or so feet to the to the thicket line. Big, there's sage grass, and it looks like you drug a mop of blood through that. I go over there and look, and it was a deer trail, and it was kind of like going through a tunnel about chest high. I kneel down and look, and I look up in that hole well, over there about 30 or so feet. This deer's laying in this, this path. You know, it's just growed up around it, but it's laying on its side. I step over the, the tall grass and I duck down and kind of duck walk for a little bit. And then I can stand up and I walk up to this buck. I thought it was a real nice eight point. Well, it didn't have any brow tines. It was just little nubs sticking up barely. You couldn't count them for points. And then it had three on each side. So it's a real nice six point, about an 18 inch spread. It's a nice buck. This deer's probably going to weigh 180, 185 pounds. Okay, it's dead. I'm talking about dead. I walk up straight behind it. Take my boot, kick it on the rump. The deer just kind of jiggles. I step around and grab its horns because horns are kind of in the leaves and the, the debris on the ground. I grab its horns and I pick its head up. Well, when I do, I bend its neck completely back around. Its tongue's hanging out. It's not breathing. Its eyes are open. You know, it's dead. Dude, I look at it for a couple of seconds and I lay its head back down. I thought, now nah, I got to get this big sucker out of here. I go back, go back out in the field, walk, you know, across the field and then go the 200 yards to the truck, get out, unlock the gate, swing it open, drive my truck to it, back up where I get out. Here's all this blood. I'm at the right spot. You know, there's blood everywhere where I just came from. I've been gone 10 minutes. Drop the tailgate, step over there. And when I bend over to go get my deer, I look in the hole and the deer's gone. And I'm going, what in the world? So I step over, go up in there to it, and look. There's a puddle of blood. I mean, like, like big as a, you know, it's like 20-something inches across this big pool of, pool of lung, pink, hot, bright pink lung blood. There's no drag marks. There's no nothing. This deer is like it's just, just evaporated. And I've had that six times where we would shoot a deer. Sometimes they'd be laying in the edge of the field. But if you get out of sight, there's nobody there watching or keeping an eye on it. Your deer, you come back, it's probably going to be gone. How, how did they behave? Did their temperament change after they got the deer? Did they Were they still checking you guys out, following you, or did they just take oh, the deer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, didn't really, it didn't really change anything as far as like, hey, you know, we got his deer. Let's, you know, we'll, we'll be easy on him for a few days. No, it didn't. That didn't really affect it. Oh, my dad, my dad shot a, shot a deer down there. Uh, it's actually across the river on a different piece of property. It's uh, half a mile, three quarters of a mile. And this was some, you know, few years after that one. But uh, dad shot a deer and the deer laid dead, laid dead in the field for an hour and a half or longer. I, I, 
best I can remember. And uh, it got dark and I came from another stand, got in my Jeep and I had to drive over a mile to come get dad. I pulled up, he got out of his stand and he got in my Jeep. I said, what'd you shoot? He said, well, those, those does came out across the field where you told me they'd been coming out. And dude, I'd set in that stand that I'd put him in several days in a row. And you could set your watch. It was a herd of does would come out every day and they would feed down this field and then they'd go back in the woods. Well, dad had been, dad had cancer and he'd been sick and stuff like that. And he hadn't hunted much and he hadn't killed anything. And he's like, man, your mom needs some meat. I said, well, look, if you'll go with me, I'll drive you to the stand, get in it. It's a shooting a box wind up on poles. I said, get in it. I know you'll see those does. They're coming out every day. I told him about what time they're going to come out. And that was about uh, the time that I heard his, his rifle go off. Well, he told me, he said, I shot one of those does that come out. He said, I picked out a big one. And I shot it. I said, what it do? He said, well, he said, it turned her flip. She jumped up and run a little bit and failed. There's an old log road that goes in the woods. And I had bush hogged right up to it. So the grass was cut really short. And there was just a little bit of sage grass before you actually went in the woods. He said, the deer fell. And the front half of it was in the tall grass. And the, the, the back half of it was laying out in the, the cut grass. I said, it just lay there. He said, oh, yeah. I said, it, he said, I saw it pick its head up and said, you know, it curled its neck and said, uh, I heard it like we call it a death blow. You'll hear them uh, and their head will fall. And he said, it did that. And he said, she's done. Said she didn't kick. So that thing's laid right there. And he said, she, she's straight across the field. I said, she's in that road. I said, he said, yeah. Well, instead of driving all the way around this 28 acre field, I just cut and in my Jeep, we drive across. We pull up and I've got headlights are on bright and I've got two big KC off-road lights on the winch bumper and two up on the side by the by the doors by the windshield. And I've got all these lights on. We drive over and when I pull up, I said, Where's your deer? He said, It's right. Well, hey, well, it was it was laying right there. So I pull up right where his deer had been laying. Put my Jeep in, you know, in neutral and pull up mercy brake or parking brake. I get out and look and there's this big massive, I mean, the puddle of blood's as big as my torso and it's laying exactly where he said it would have been. And there is nothing. I mean, it's just blood. There's a big massive puddle of blood and the deer's, the deer's gone. I mean, it's not there. And I go to look and he said, well, I don't know where it went or what would have got it. He said, I ain't heard any coyotes. I ain't heard any anything. I said, daddy, there's, there's no blood drug. There's no, the grass ain't fell over or, or anything drug your deer. I said, undoubtedly, it didn't get up and walk off. He said, no, no, that deer's dead. He said, I'm talking about totally dead. Well, I go to looking, just a few feet into the tall sage grass, there was a big oval impression. I'm talking about probably, the impression was probably 20 inches, and it was probably 12 inches wide, but it was mashed in it, and about four or five feet behind it, I found another one, then I found another one. I said, well, I know what happened to your deer. He said, what? I said, the booger man got your deer. Oh, well, you think so? I said, yeah, I think so. I said, come here and look. I showed the showing these impressions in the, in the sage was deer was gone. We looked, we stomped around, shined a lot all out of the field, just double check, make sure nothing was there. And I looked down, there was no log road. I never found a, a drop of blood. I never found anything. We, it was like, the, like I said, like, like it's like the, the deer just sucked in the ground. A couple of days later, I go back to that field. I drive in, I come in on the opposite end of the field. And I'm, I don't know, four, probably three, 400 yards from where he had shot this deer and he'd been laying. And I see something out in the, in the field. So I cut my, cut my Jeep sideways and grab my rifle and I lay it out the window, turn the scope up. And I'm like, what is that? And I first thought it was a coyote maybe, but it, it was, I saw that it wasn't standing. It was laying in the field. So I just pulled my rifle in and I'm driving and drive over there and look, well, exactly where I pulled up and shined my lights when we were there looking for his deer. I just t spun the steering wheel on the Jeep and I made a loop and we left. It had rained shortly before we had hunted and I had ran out of seed to plant that part of the field. So it was just kind of bare dirt and it was wet and the, the rain had kind of erased out any tracks. Well, there's a deer carcass. This carcass is laying out in the field and where I turned my Jeep around, you could see my tracks just as pretty. Dude, I had my, my Jeep tracks were within eight, 10 feet of this carcass. It's laying right there. And if that deer had been laying there, I mean, I would have had all these KC lights on. It would have been like laying in the wide open 
we had absolutely walked around the Jeep looking. We had walked over that two grown men with big spotlights. That deer was not there when we were there, you know, looking for it. What I did find with this carcass is this carcass has been absolutely picked clean except for the, the front shoulder meat. A lot of the rib meat was gone and I found a bullet hole in one of the ribs on the side that dad would have shot that would have lined up with a, a lung shot. And on the opposite side, there was a chunk of one of the ribs that was gone. Like the bullet went in small on one rib and expanded and it cut a whole chunk out where it came out enlarged on the other side. All the sweet meat, all the, the insides of this deer were gone. There were none. It, the carcass was hollow. But the thing about it, the hide on this deer looked like you'd grabbed it in the middle of the back and pulled it. The hide on the front was stretched up over its head. Now this thing's neck, and this is what I don't understand. The thing's neck was like it was twisted and folded back up on the body. It was like you had just wring, wrung its neck and laid it back. And the hide is pulled up over the shoulders, up on the, the neck of pretty good waist. The hide on the back of it is stretched nearly completely off. So you got this big, long streak of hide hanging one way, a big, long streak of hide hanging the other. And this carcass is all in this twisted up pile. Well, I go to looking at this ground that had rained on a few days before. There's no tracks and, you know, how the dirt kind of smooths the, the, the soil out. I look and you can see several feet from where this carcass is laying like where it's indented and you could see like where it impacted or not, or it made impact with the dirt. And you could see where it had rolled the carcass had like been thrown and it hit the ground and rolled and kind of messed the dirt up. And it stopped over here. Dude, it was like something came up at the wood line. Like they had got whatever they wanted from the carcass from that deer came back and said, here, you can have the scraps and just flung it. But you've got a, a deer carcass this was probably a 120, 130 pound doe deer. We've got what's left of it, which there's not a whole lot left, but around that carcass, there was no, absolutely no other deer tracks. There was no coon tracks. There's no possum tracks. There's no coyote tracks. There's not even any buzzard tracks. The, the dirt is, it, it, look, it, it rained before dad shot this deer. So, I don't know what kept the other animals away. I don't know how long it had actually been thrown back in the field. But dude, it was like, it made me feel like this thing got what it wanted and it brought it back is kind of taunting us like, like we'll take from you what we want. We'll throw you a few scraps. But that thing had been flung back in a, back out in the field. And dude, this is like, I can't remember exactly. It was probably 50 feet, say from the wood line where, where the, you know, if anything come on out in there, we would have tracks. But you could absolutely see with this, what the remainder of this carcass, it impacted the ground and rolled and it stopped. Now those, the pictures of that, uh, Bill White, Tal Bronco, he wrote a, a Southern Bigfoot Files book and that encounter and then some of my encounters and my dad's encounters are in that book. And the pictures that I took of that carcass are in that book. I can't remember what page, but uh, that that's in the Southern Bigfoot Files book. Uh, but the, that people can go look at the pictures. Do you think that was intimidation trying to show you who's boss, who's the alpha of the areas? Do you think that's what was going on? I think that's exactly what it was. I really do. I mean, that's the way it made me feel anyway. And I mean, I don't know why they why they, I can't think any other reason from to bring it back and like fling it out in the field. But yeah, it, it that spooked me pretty bad. Yeah. Now you've had a lot of experiences while hunting. Um, did they start following you home eventually? Well, not really home, but where I'm sitting and a lot of these folks have heard me talk about my man cave. I've got a cabin on the river. And from where I had majority of my encounters, crow fly is just a barely over a mile through the woods right behind this wall right here, uh, across a, a big two lane highway, but then you hit woods and it's, it's woods. All it is is woods and it's hills and hollows and a river. And then it pops out in that property. But look, I'd been dealing with these things for, for several years 
And then I bought this piece of property where I'm at here on the river from my cousin that owned that piece of property, but he got on up in years and I'd been, it took me probably 15 years or so before I finally talked him into selling me this property here. And I put my man cave here. And all I can tell you, Chris, that what I kind of put together is these things got to seeing me so much right through the woods here. And they were coming through this area too. I mean, and I think they, they probably recognized my truck. They probably knew what I looked like. And they pinpointed out that, Hey, this guy that's coming over here to our house. He's got a house right over there. We'll swing by and see this guy because man, I have encounters all the time here as far as they'll come up and knock on my cabin wall. And when I say knock, not gently, because it'll shake the whole cabin. They'll come up and just like wham and slam the wall. Uh, usually it's the wee hours of the morning, you know, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, before I added, I actually built or put the cabin part in and I added on to it. But I used to sleep in the, the living room a lot. I had a couch right by the, by, real close to the window. And there was a big six inch by six inch pressure treated post four foot in the ground that went up for the, for the porch. The dang thing would hit the porch post like directly behind my head on the wall and it would shake a like a, a 14 by 40 foot porch it would shake the whole porch and shake the cabin and they would just they would just like it walk up and it, it sound honest to god it sounded like somebody took a 20 pound sledge and hit that post and it would be you know one two o'clock in the morning hit one time it'd wake me up i'd get up and turn the lights on and couldn't see nothing, but I've came up and I've saw them, you know, heard them walking around in the woods, be bipedal. I've come up, come up one night. I got up on the porch and I had the creepy feels. I'd, I'd been out doing law enforcement work, pulled up out here. I thought, well, I'm going to go over here and sleep instead of going the other seven or so. That's about seven and a half miles to my actual home. I pulled up and when I opened the door, I got the creepy feels like something's here. Something's watching me. So I reached back on the console and I grab a, a long gun, step out. I walk around and go up on that porch to come in. And dude, it was, it was all I could do to walk up on the porch. And, you know, I've got a sidearm, a long gun and I unlock the door and I just kind of crack the door to open it. I just back up against the wall and I'm standing there looking down through the woods and it was a little bit of moonlight and I've got a security light, which it illuminates part of the yard. Well, I stand there for several minutes. And then it's about 200 and uh, between 200, 250 feet to the water's edge off this. It's off a pretty good mountain right here, but the, the river runs like north and south. And I'm looking west off down at the river's edge. I hear a long monotone whistle. I mean, it's loud. It's very, very, very loud. It's just a long whistle. And as soon as that whistle stops, like I'm looking west kind of to my, it would be actually, it'd be north, northwest, but in my yard, like 30 feet, I've got a shipping container, a Connex shipping container for just like a storage building. Against that wall of that storage building, something starts walking, what's in the, the dark, because the storage building has what little bit of lights over there shaded. This thing starts bipedal walking. It just steps like straight into the woods. And I listen to it bipedal, just tromp, tromp. Trump, Trump, and it goes straight off the dang mountain to where that whistle came from. And this thing is not being quiet. I mean, it's breaking limbs. It's popping, you know, it's crunching leaves and it walks right off the hill and goes right down to where that whistle was. And it goes, you know, it goes down there and I can't hear it anymore. So I come on in, shut the door and lock it. But um, I have a lot of encounters here. Uh, a lot of the people, I mean, a lot, a lot of my, my extended family, Spencer Jameson, Misty Haynes, Mr. Mark Noble. Oh, uh, all the ladies of SAS, Miss Sherry and Donna and her husband, Jim, you know, I, I've got a lot of my friends that I, you know, like I said, I look at these folks family, but I told them, I said, y'all come see me. Y'all, y'all come just, just come stay with me here at the man cave, you know, get you a mini vacation, whatever you want to call it. Y'all come down here. I want to show y'all around. I'm going to show you where a lot of these encounters happen. Show you around my properties. Uh, I want y'all to come just, just stay a week with me. Well, the first trip, it was Mark Noble and Spencer and Misty. They came. I got bedrooms on each side right here and one in the back. 
every day they were here, they had an encounter. Now, nobody saw one like a class A sighting, but we had, you know, whoops and, and knocks and screams in the distance. Uh, we couldn't, the road that goes down, this old road that goes down into the property where I used to hunt, I, could, I mean, I'm driving them down there in my Jeep and Misty and Mark's, they're, they're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Spencer, because everybody's looking out the window and they're going, there's a structure. There's a big X. Look, or there, there's a teepee or that. We can't go, we can't go, you know, 250 feet and they're screaming out the window. There's this. And look, 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 look. I don't look for that stuff. I mean, I, I'm, I'm driving in here to show them where I used to hunt. So they're, they're seeing all this structure and y'all that's less than half a mile right here. Just, just up the hill and then turn going to property. Well then later on, Sherry and Donna and, uh, Mr. Jim and then Misty shows back up different people. Flat Rock's been up here. Uh, you know, we sit out on my porch on my back deck and we're, we're just talking. I tell them, look, we don't, my, my cardinal rule is I don't provoke these things. I get the encounters that they choose to let me have. I'm just trying to live my life and be me a normal dude. And these things show up. They, they come up here and they, they do their thing. They let me know they're here. And, I get the encounter they want me to have because I've had them where they didn't look at me as peaceful. They didn't like me at all. They kept trying to run me off. And then I finally kind of made peace with them. And that was by sheer accident, but they kind of coincide with us and they, they kind of leave us alone. And that I'm like, look, if you'll just come and y'all come and stay, odds are you can record some things. You're going to hear some things, but we do not provoke them. We don't do, I don't put out stuff for them. I don't scream at them. I don't, I don't put out cameras. They just do their thing. They come up, let me know. Hey, look, I like, Hey, we're, we're out here or whatever. And it's been so awesome to me for, for all these folks to come here and they've had some encounters. I mean, they've had a lot of encounters. Oh, uh, Misty's got hit. Misty got hit was infrasound or something laying in the bed right here and freaked her out. Uh, Coon, you know, Kumbo is one of my best buddies. He's like my brother. Uh, Kumbo was leaving. I was actually going to go home because uh, Sherry and Misty and Donna and Jim and all of us here. And I said, look, y'all y'all take the bedrooms. I'll go stay at my house seven miles away. When we, me and Kumbo started to leave, we walked out the door. We saw a silhouette. It wasn't a great sighting, but we saw something right behind my propane tank. And it, like all three of us saw that and saw some red eye shine on it. But uh, we've had several boogers been seen right here. Uh, my buddy Alan come up on the porch Christmas last Christmas walks up on the porch and I got a 500 gallon propane tank 30 feet from the porch. He hadn't saw anything. He walks up just as he flattens out on the porch, just a couple of steps from the door. He hears Ugh, and looks, there's one standing behind the propane tank with his hands kind of on the tank, leaning over it, looking at him from 30 feet. And they have a stare down for a couple of minutes and he didn't know what to do, but he finally kind of just like waved at it slow and the thing just stood there. So he gets the door open and gets inside and barricades the door. Um, uh, as I told you before the show, I told a few people to meet and greet today. Today's a week ago. We had a storm front come through. I went to my house because I've got a massive storm shelter in my house. The clouds parted and kind of the bad storms went north and south. So I came back over here to the man cave when I pulled up when I pulled up out here about about a quarter till nine. My headlights, uh, you go up a drive and it, you turn a corner, turn to the right and the, it kind of levels out. And you see my man cave. I'm driving up and my headlights are shining to the left end toward the wood line and behind it. And it's not far from the corner of the porch. It's only probably 30 feet to the wood line. If the thing had stood still, I wouldn't have saw it because I was looking for it. I mean, I'm looking for them every time I pull up, but the thing bolted, it took off and it was going from, from straight in front of me to my right, just straight across. But I watched a giant upright black mass. And I mean, quick, it went from dead stop to, to wide open. It would like accelerate. It went woo. But I watched it, and this thing, according to where the porch post was, it went within probably 10 feet of the, the corner post of that porch. This thing had to be between eight, nine feet at least. Massive. And I was getting a side profile, but the thing was so black. It was like the headlight, like the light was, was being absorbed by it. 
it was like it was, it was crazy because it was like the light wasn't reflecting back to me at all. There was nothing shiny, no sheen to it. It was just like the black. It was so black, like the light. It was just it was nearly like you were erasing part of part of a picture as it's going across. But dude, it, it, it was it was massive. And the ones that I've seen are massive. I'm talking about and the, all the ones I've saw uh, that made four that I've I've got really pretty dang good looks at now that ain't counting the ones that i've seen something go from tree to tree or i saw something through the bushes over the years i count the ones that there's nothing between me and them that i get a, a pretty dang good look at but i've saw four in the last uh what was january the 29th of 2009 was the first one i ever saw that was a by, by then i'd done been dealing with them for nine years I couldn't lay eyes on one. I'd had dozens and dozens and dozens of encounters. And dude, I've had these things really close to me many, 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 many times. Matter of fact, I stepped, walked past one within about six feet. And that thing huff grunted at me and I like scared me to death. So, you know, but, but that like a week ago, I mean, we're another two hours from right now. Well, yeah. Basically, two hours from right now would be exactly a week that I saw one right here in my yard. We're talking from where I'm sitting, 60 feet. Was it like you saw an outline, like you were seeing through it, like it was so black? It was like you were seeing the outline of something in the night? I oh, mean, it, 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 was, it would be like if you were looking at this picture of me and somebody held up something that was black, like like super black. And where it's going, it's like it's covering up. You can't see through it. But it was like I couldn't get the details. It was so black. It was like the light was not reflecting off of it at all. It was like there was no sheen, no detail, no nothing. But it would be just like like coming across and whatever my hand's covering up, if this was super black, but it, it nearly makes my hand, because there's no reflection off of it, it's like, you, like you've erased it. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, it, was, it was crazy. Now, it... Oh. So you've had dozens and dozens of experiences over the years. You're obviously in their habituation site. They're obviously living where you're living, where you're yeah. hunting, where you're staying. Um, I'm sure everybody in the in the chat would like would love to hear what is what is the craziest interaction that you've ever ever had out there. Well, in solo layout again for this one. So, all right. Oh. Um. The scariest, the scariest encounter that I've ever had, and I'm on, I'm on dedicate this to my adopted brother Spencer Jameson because I apparently he's got a touch of PTSD from me telling it. But y'all, if y'all ever hear us reference the motorcycle incident, uh, I was in here hunting. It's been many years ago now, but I had my buddy Alan, and uh, a lot of a lot of y'all know Alan. He's come on some on woodwalkers with me and talked about our encounters, but, uh, Alan, Alan and I went hunting and, uh, I put him in the upper green field and I had decided that the deer were skirting the outside of the property we were on and they were going through some big hardwoods. And instead of me going and hunting the other green field down by the river, I told Alan, I said, go out there and hunt the upper field. That's where you want to go. I'm going to go around. I could go up, up the forestry service road to the edges of the property that my cousin had and I could cut and there was an old log road that went in kind of down the property line and it popped out of a big a big pine thicket but it was just a big area of these big massive pine trees I mean huge pines so when I'm walking in on my on my right directly to my right it's this old growed up thicket but I'm walking through these big giant pine trees and there's a lot of vines and undergrowth these these trees are kind of spaced out pretty good. They've been thin, you know, thinned out years ago, and that's what I guess allowed them to get really big. But I walked through that, I don't know, 100 yards, 140 yards, and it pops out into big hardwoods. It's all hardwood trees. And where you come out, there's a, a hollow that starts, and it starts go. the terrain starts going downhill, and it, it's like a valley this way, you know, like a big valley. And I'm up here on the top. Well, I get there and I get to where I can see down this hill and back up the other side. And I can see pretty much all the way down you know, a few hundred yards down to the uh, to the river. I could cover a lot of ground with a, a high-powered rifle. And I'm thinking, okay, if the deer come through and they're going in to get some acorns, 
I'm going to see them. I'll, I've got a long, a big piece of ground that I can, I can own this real estate with my gun. If there's, if there's a, a shootable buck, I can kill it. So I get in there and I get to this big pine tree, kind of where it starts rolling over and I rake all the leaves back or the straw and leaves. I rake it back and get it where it's good, fresh dirt. And I can sit down on it. I didn't have a stool. I didn't have anything. I was just sitting on the ground. So I sit there for a few hours. I got my rifle laying on my lap and I'm just sitting there. I got my kind of my arms folded up. It was cold weather wearing an orange toboggan on top of a, a ball cap. Well, I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I don't have a, a real long time. It's going to get dark. I'm going to pack it up. You know, I hadn't saw anything, but from where I'm sitting and I'm looking, Al, Al is like to my straight, straight off my shoulder. He's about 250 yards through this thicket to this green field. Well, he's over there. So I know where Al's at and know about how far he is. And I, I'm, I'm listening, you know, he's not made any, you know, he's definitely not shot anything. So I'm thinking, well, maybe he's at least saw something. Well, back over, kind of over this shoulder, kind of more behind me, the opposite way from Al is the main highway. It's a two-lane paved road, and it's about a mile. But when you get a, a loud, like a big truck or something, you could you could hear it because the sound would kind of come down the hollows by the river to where we were. Well, out of the blue, I hear a motorcycle. And it sounded like the guy was having engine trouble on the motorcycle, like it was getting too much fuel. It was flooding and he starts revving it up. And in my mind, I'm picturing this big burly biker dude. And he's, you know, he's got, and it's not, it's not like a, a, a ninja or something like that. This is, we talking about, you know, maybe a Harley or something that type. And un, apparently it didn't have any mufflers, exhaust on it or whatever, because this thing was loud. I'm talking about, horribly loud and it was like i'm picturing this dude he's you know probably parked on the side of the road and he's he's got it running and i'm hearing him he's revving it up you know i'm, I'm picturing he's twisting the throttle and it's going -ma, -ma, -ma. and i'm going oh my god you know because here i am it's nice and quiet and I, i've only i don't have a lot of time left on this evening and I got some dude up here revving up and he's disturbing everything. And I'm thinking, you know, the deer's going to freeze. If they're on their hooves, they're going, they're going to stop. And they're, they're probably going to be focused on this. You know, I'm thinking this guy may be a long way from me, but you know, him making all this noise, it's, it's messing my hunt up. Well, the thing about it, when he revved that bike up at third time and let off, you know, right directly behind me, like through this big giant pine tree over my shoulder, I'm out in the hardwoods about 85, 90 feet guessing it, it's not far from the big timber, the big pines where there's, yeah, there's some, some dogwood trees and some saplings and stuff, but there it's like tiny compared to these big giant pines. And there's all kind of old honeysuckles and stuff like that. So up to about, probably 12, 14 feet from the ground up. You know, it, it's still like a wall of, of just nasty. Y'all, I hear the most horrible, awful sound apparently a human being could hear on the planet made by an animal. Um, I tell people it wasn't a scream and it wasn't a roar. It was more of a, like a Bella roar, scream, howl. This thing starts off and it's like super deep. And it's kind of like a, a bull, a bovine bull bellowing. And it holds this note for like a, a while. And then the the vocal cranks up. It starts going up. And it goes into like a roar. Like, like we started out like a bull bellowing. And it cranks up into like a lion roaring. Well, then it goes on up into like a man screaming. And then it goes up into like a woman screaming. And then as it polishes off on the end, it's like a, like a coyote howl or a wolf. And it, the end of that, the end of that, it would stop so abruptly and just like, just like crack. It, it like had a pop at the end of it, like somebody cracking a whip. But this thing started off and it just kept going and going and going and going and going. And it's like, my God, it's not going to quit. Is this is doing this, y'all? I mean, I, I'm like somebody's just slammed a basketball to the ground. I mean, it's like I, I hardly can remember 
like from sitting, the sheer panic hits me. And it's like I blink and I'm standing up and I'm hiding behind this big, massive tree. One of the first thing I did, like as I'm behind this tree, I grab my toboggan, my orange toboggan and rip it off and jam it down in my coat because I got a big, heavy winter coat, you know, camouflage. Because I'm afraid I'm going to be seen. I'm afraid I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb with this orange. And I'm like stuffing the, the, the camo down in my clothing. And I can't remember. I either stuffed it in my coat or either in the, I had like bib, insulated bibs. I either stuffed it in that or in my jacket. And y'all, I'm like bringing my eyeball, like peeking around the tree, trying to look. Well, this thing has, has quit screaming. And y'all, I'm holding my rifle and I'm, I'm hit, I'm peeping around and I'm trying to listen and figure out, because this thing's right on me. I don't know at this time. I don't know if it's in the opening. I don't know if it's in the thicket. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm in full-blown panic. Like, oh my God. Just a couple of minutes pass, motorcycle. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Just as soon as it stops, three, two, one bell roar scream howl again and it just and y'all just want to tell people when this is hard to explain to somebody the volume of this was so horrible it was like it's hitting me in my face my clothing it's like my my clothing is just vibrating it's like my insides are vibrating and it's so loud that i'm holding this rifle head that i'm wanting to to hold my ears because it is absolutely killing my ears it's so loud and it's so loud to the point that when it would peak part of that scream when it would change decibels or not decibels but it was changing like the the tone my eyes my vision would get blurry it was it was like you would turn a camera out of focus for a second and then it would clear back up it was so i mean i can't explain i can if you took it's kind of like being really close to a freight train. And when they blow the horn, you feel that blast. That's what I was getting a mile from anything over here in these woods. And this is by a animal doing it. Not, we're not talking about a locomotive. We're talking about an animal that's screaming. And it's the volume of a locomotive or more of, of the most horrible sound that I've ever heard in my life. Well, it's like a blast hitting me and I am freaked out. Like, Oh my God, this thing is irate. It's here. It's, it's ready to destroy something because it starts breaking limbs. It's breaking saplings. I watch a dogwood tree. The base is, I mean, it's way bigger than an ice cream bucket. I watched the top part of this tree being jerked back and forth. And this thing's going like from, from straight up, it's going this way, 12 foot. It's going that way 12 foot and then it would go round and around and around. It'd go back this way. It'd go back forth. And I'm hearing limbs sound like they're bigger than my forearm snapping. It sounds like rifle shots at the limbs being broke. I'm hearing this thing stomp. It would stomp back and forth and back and forth. And it's like there's a 20 foot section of these woods or better. And it's like it's annihilating everything in it. Well, I'm hiding behind this tree with a semi-automatic brown and 30 out six. And I'm thinking, I need help. I don't know what to do. And I, in my mind, if this thing comes out, I've got to try to kill it because it's fixing to tear me apart. I've got my phone. I had an old flip phone, had it on vibrate. My phone goes, zzz, zzz. I turn my rifle loose and I grab my, my phone out. And I look, Al is sitting 200 and so yards through his thicket. He sent me the text, capital U space OK. I grab my phone, I type H E L L space N O, send. Just a second, I'm holding it and I'm still, I'm peeping, I'm peeping, I'm trying to glance at my phone, I'm peeping around the street and this thing's got quiet. And I read the, the, the letters back, said O N space O. W-A-Y, on way. He was going to come to me, and he did. Y'all, the motorcycle revs up again. This thing is shredding 
the woods. I'm talking about shredding everything around it. I'm thinking, okay, I've got a 357 Magnum. It's a, it's a Tylo custom Smith and Wesson 357 that I, I paid well over a thousand dollars for. I've killed with that gun. I think I've killed 12 deer with it. And I got another 357 I've killed 11 with. I've killed 23 deer with a pistol. I carry it with me. And a lot of times if I get a, a deer in less than hundred yards, I want to shoot it with a pistol. I'll shoot it with a pistol. But this shot is a, it's a, a combat plus revolver holds seven rounds instead of six. I had a, a real renowned gunsmith go through this gun and fix it for me to hunt with. He changed the springs, changed the trigger tension, changed the sights. I've got a lot of money in this gun. I would tell you, but my wife probably see this and then she want to choke me. But anyway, I've got this tactical 357 Magnum with some very bad rounds in it. I've got a semi-automatic Browning 30 out six in my hands and I'm in a panic. Because whatever's in these woods, I'm not sure that I have enough to even do anything to it. Y'all, that thing throws fit. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I'm fixing to be the dude that's fixing to have to, I'm at least going to have to try to kill one because I don't want to be a victim. I refuse to be a victim in the woods. But, y'all, the big fear that I had was that all these encounters to this point that we'd had with these things, one thing that had in common, about 90% of the encounters if they left while you were there before we left, most time when they'd leave, they would they would leave where you were and they would go toward it didn't matter where they came from. When they would leave, they would go toward the river. They would go toward that river to leave. Well, the thing that's in my head, this thing's here. I'm here and the river is this way, the way I'm standing now. Now I'm thinking, oh my God, when it steps out of that thicket into this hardwoods where it's going to be hard for me to hide. I'm going to be the first thing that's going to be out of place. I'm the first thing that don't belong. And this thing is worked up into a frenzy. It's going to be a bad day for me. I was absolutely, you could have cut my throat and there wouldn't have been nothing come out but air. I'm talking about, I, I think every drop of blood was from my kneecaps down. I was in a dire panic of, Oh my God, what am I going to do? And I've done devised a plan. Look, I'm fixing to, if this thing comes out, I'm fixing to try to shoot it in the eyeball, in the throat. I don't know what's going to happen if I shoot it in the chest, but I'm fixing to be the dude that's fixing to have to try like hell to kill one of these things. And that was the last thing I wanted to do because most of the encounters we've had with these things, one thing that I can tell you, they're not by themselves. Most of the time, there's one really, really close. So if I do take out this one, where's its friend at? Where's the other ones at? Where's the rest of that troop? So then what am I dealing with? But in my mind, my buddy Al's got to come out of this tree stand that now is over my left shoulder. He's got to go almost 300 yards to get to my truck. Then he's got to come up this road, probably 100, 120 yards, and then turn to come in here 200 yards where I'm at to get to me. Well, there was no sneaking out because where I'm at and where this thing is, if I'd left to get back, the only way I had feasible to get in my truck, if this thing where it was, is at my 12 o'clock, the road, the only path out of there was at 11 o'clock. I would have went down a log road that would have put me within 30 or 40 feet of this thing, not a hundred feet. Cause I can see in there pretty good about 30 yards, about 90 feet. This thing couldn't have been over probably another 20 feet into the thicket. I just could not lay eyes on it. But I am sitting here listening to it tear these woods all to pieces. Y'all, it got quiet. I'm sitting there. I mean, I, I'm just shaking. I'm, I'm jerking and trying to hold my composure. And I'm thinking, okay, if it comes out, as soon as it sees me, it's probably going to hesitate. I'm fixing to put rounds on it. And okay, how, how am I going to reload this rifle quick? And my plan is, okay, I'm going to dump five rounds really quick. If that don't put it down, my best bets, swing the rifle to my left hand. I'm going to draw this revolver and I'm going to go to work with it. So I know I've got five and seven. I've got 12 rounds that I got to make count. Y'all, it gets quiet. And I'm sitting here and all I can hear in my ears 
is my heart going boom, 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 A few minutes pass. I don't mean long. A few minutes pass. Motorcycle revs up. Same thing. Three times. And when this thing does the bellow, roar, scream, howl, this thing has went from where it's at, a hundred or so feet, feet, not yards, a hundred or so feet from me. It sounds like it's 400 yards through the woods toward the motorcycle. I never heard it leave. It never broke a limb. It never crushed a leaf. But it was had to be the same one. It was the exact same bell roar, scream, howl. But this thing is like it went from here, 400 yards to here, toward the motorcycle. Y'all, my knees nearly buckled in just a sigh of relief. I, I tell you what, I can remember laying my head into the tree and going, thank you, Lord. I step, stand back up and I'm looking around and I'm trying to make sure that there's nothing else here. And I'm going, I got to get out of here. And I got to go about probably 80 or 90 feet through these leaves to get into the, sure enough, just pine straw to get on back out the 100 or so yards to the gravel road. We well, all, I mean, I, I'm, I'm letting my heel hit the ground, letting my foot roll to the side and trying not to make any noise. And when I got there on that straw, I, I was, look, I'm not a speed demon, but I mean, I, I was trying to move on as quickly and quietly as I could. And I, I, I jokingly tell people, I'll say it again, it's like when we were kids and watching Fred Flintstone and he was sneaking, he'd get up on his tippy toes and that's the way I felt. But as soon as I popped out of the timber into that, the road was old Forest Service Road, had the big, the big rock in it, big as my fist, big old limestone rock. When I pop out into that limestone, I look and to my left, their old brother Allen was, he's got his rifle, he hunts with a brown and uh, a bolt seven mag and he's got his rifle and he's coming to me. I mean, he's not like running, but he's, he's steadily walking and I pop out and he's done got his rifle. He's not pointing at me, but he's got it up because he don't really realize it's me. Cause I don't have any orange on. And I see him y'all. And I, I mean, I wanted to fold up and hit the ground. And he, his first words, he said, are you okay? I said, I, I, I think so. I said, let's go to the truck. So we start toward the truck and he's like, dude, that thing was right in your lap. I said, brother, you, you don't have no idea. It was, he was in my lap. He, I said, dude, he was hundred, hundred feet. He's like, my God, I ain't never heard nothing sound like that. I said, I know. He's like, dude, that was hurting my ears where I was. And I knew about where you were in the timber over there. And I knew it was right on top of you. I said, brother, you, you have no clue. You have no clue. And I told him, I said, man, I, and look, you know, we're, we're moving on pretty, we're like speed walking back to the truck. When we get back to my truck, I open the driver's door and he goes, are you all right? I said, dude, I think so. I said, I, I, he said, well, can you drive? I said, yeah, I, I think I can drive. He said, are you sure you're okay? I said, man, I will be. Just give me a minute. Y'all, I got the truck door open. I stick the barrel of my, my rifle in the floorboard and I lay the buttstock up on the seat under the steering wheel. And right then I was, that's kind of when it hit me that I made it, I made it out. I didn't have to shoot this thing. It didn't, you know, pop my head off like squishing a grape or it didn't rip me limb from limb. And all I can tell you is I had an adrenaline, just a dump. Because y'all, I, I grabbed with my left hand, I grabbed the, the door on my truck and I grabbed the, the steering wheel or the seat one with my right hand. And I, I just, I bowed up and I, I, I puked, I puked three times. I mean, all I could do was throw up. I vomited right there and I'm backing up. He's like, dude, are you sure you're all right? And I'm, I'm trying to wipe my face. I'm looking for a rag. I said, I'll be all right. I said, just get in the truck. Just, just get in the truck. And y'all, we, we got in the truck and, and come out of there. And he's like, oh my God. And he looks at me and goes, well, that son of a gun hated that motorcycle, didn't it? I said, dude, that that's all it was. It, it, whatever it, it, it had to be. And what we put together is I, I think the thing didn't realize that was a internal combustion engine. I don't, I don't know, but I know loud noises set these things off. And I don't know if it looked at it like it was a challenge. I don't know if it was, I don't, I don't know, 
but I know it absolutely went wild and it was upset. And, you know, I, I really do. I, I believe that was probably the alpha of the troop here, but I know one thing I, I don't, I don't care anything about being in that, that spot ever again, as far as, you know, having, having to deal with that ever, never. Wow. Uh, number one, thank you. Cause you can tell you relive it when you're telling the story, you can tell the, you can see it uh, in your, in, in you can feel it. When you tell that story, I felt it. And, uh, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty intense. Um, I don't even know where to go from, from, from there, but, uh, do you think it might have been the frequency that that, that that motorcycle that was that it was that was making it mad like it was hitting a some a certain note or something that was just driving it crazy maybe it couldn't take take the the, the motorcycle's noise well chris I, I mean i've had these things get touched off by loud noise uh every now and then we'd have a like a i'm not far from a military base it's probably 60 miles north of me in huntsville alabama Every now and then we would get like jet, like fighter jet stuff fly over. And if they would fly over, like especially late in the evening, it would touch these things off. You would hear them scream at it. You know, it would scream or roar, but it wasn't that. It wasn't that bell roar, scream, howl. Um, it wasn't, it wouldn't be like that. It would just be a horrible scream and it would make them mad. But I've also heard like uh, diesel trucks go off this hill down toward the bridge and they would use their engine brakes or their Jake brake and that, you know, how that, brrrr, that would touch them off. But I think between the, maybe the, the volume of the, the motorcycle, maybe the tone, but it kept going, you know, it was, it was three because it would rev up and quit and rev up and quit and rev up and quit. I think it, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's all I come up with. It was maybe the, the pitch, the, the frequency, and you know it done it maybe three times, and dude it, and then and then once it it yelled at it or it bell roar or scream howled at it, then the motorcycle does it again, and I don't know if it looked at hey I'm challenging you, and then when it the motorcycle did its thing, it looked at that as okay he's answering my challenge I'll show you, and then they're kind of like a screaming match back and forth, so. That was just intense. I, I was talking earlier during before the show. You talk about that uh, that break you were just talking about. I have a recording of a car backfiring at, down the road from one of my areas that I was recording one night, and it it, it did that backfire. It went duh, 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 and then all of a sudden you hear duh, 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 like a, a gorilla beating on a chest, like imitating or mad at something. So I've never heard that before, and until tonight. So it's just. The pieces line up once you hear and you associate with other people that, you know, like yourself, because you're, you're a wealth of knowledge, number one, because not everybody has all the situations that you've had. Not everybody has them on their property. Not, and that's why it's good to listen to you guys for awareness. And, um, but to see you in your face, that story you just told, I, I know it, 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 it's not easy to tell. And again, I thank you for that. And I'm sure the chat thanks you and the people that are listening. Thank you because uh, they're real. The fear is real. Um, they're big, they're large, they're in charge. Um, that's about, you know, what else can you say about them? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that, Chris, we, uh, me and Alan, we still, I'm talking about we still. Matter of fact, we talked about it this weekend because they, I mean, He's, he's like, he's like my, my actual family. You know I mean? He, he's like my mom and dad pretty much adopted him and he, he comes up all every holiday. He, he went with me up to the, this weekend, you know, to the LBL and me and him, we, look, if we're, I mean, we're always talking about, about boogers or Bigfoot and, and, you know, we, we still, we, we jokingly talk amongst us just, you know, still, even now we're still trying to put stuff together about that encounter that gets broke up a lot or brought up a lot. And dude, when we left, when we left down there, when we got my truck, I got it fired up and we come, come out, you know, the mile or so up that road, we absolutely were talking amongst each other. I said, dude, what are we going to do? We get up here to the end of this road where this motorcycle is. And there's a twisted up motorcycle frame you know, 20 feet up in a tree over here. 
And then over there, there's remnants of a dude with with his limbs pulled off, and he's wedged up in the forks of a tree. Honest to God, when we got out, we were both looking to see if we could see, you know, some type of carnage. And and I don't know how close the thing got to the guy. I don't know how long the guy stayed there before he left. I don't know what happened. There was nobody out there at the end of the road. But uh, I, I'm just I'm really thankful for that guy that he wasn't still on that motorcycle revving it up when that thing got wherever he got to because i mean honest to god we, we've chuckled about that that you know that that dude would have got pulled apart All right, well he almost got you guys pulled apart <laughs> i thought he was going to oh wow um got time for a couple questions we're already we're over the hour mark already i told you it goes so quick i'm gonna have to make my show a little bit longer i think moving forward. <laughs> especially when i got guests like yourself Everybody from the Appalachia, I just did the whole Appalachia little loop here, and everybody could have used some extra time. But there was a good question in here from uh, Patrick Nobel. Uh, did, oh, well, I guess you just answered. Did you guys ever see the the, the motorcycle guy? What? No, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. Pat, man, that right there is a good dude, too. Golly, I got to spend some time with Patrick this weekend. Yeah, you guys had a lot. You want to well, – yeah, before we go, let's – uh um. Let's, why don't you fill everybody a little bit? I wanted to start off the show with it, but we we got we went right into the the, the Sasquatch stuff. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about LBL, and then uh, we'll pack it up. And we'll, can you if you if you could come back again someday, and uh, sure, uh, when we got more time, and uh, uh, we'll we'll have you back because I want to talk how you help people and about with awareness and uh, cope with the uh, cope with the PTSD part of it and all of that. Yeah. So I'd like to get into that part too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well guys, I mean, this weekend was, was absolutely, I hate it for anybody that didn't get to come. Anybody that's even remotely interested in Bigfoot or having a good time or just enjoying people, man, the people that, that follow like Mark and Larry, the beast guys, you know, the woodwalkers, me and Spencer and Misty. I mean, y'all, Chris, we've got the greatest people that follow us and most of them's here in chat i'm sure but dude we had the most awesome time ever i mean we had some very very big names and you know bigfoot research bigfoot field were there i mean it you know we rented a campground spencer and misty done a lot of the groundwork there was a lot of people behind the scenes got this set up you know rented a campground is like hey if you want to come let us know you're coming won't cost you anything. We didn't charge anything for people to come and hang out and camp with us, walk around camp. We had, you know, Spencer got a load of firewood, which, you know, it wound up fizzling out the firewood. Uh, we kind of got ripped off on, but man, Mr. Ronnie Tucker, he shows up when our, when our fan shows up with a hydraulic dump bed trailer load of wood. I'm talking about, he brought like a ton truck load of wood that you could have, you know, a campfire for a month with. And then we had so many, uh, Mr. Billy Schilling, you know, Gary Spikes. It would take me a week to name these folks, just come in and, and helped out and just, just, dude, I'm talking about we are blessed by the people that have been brought in our lives. And, but dude, we had, you know, we had Coonbo, we had, you know, uh, Troy Allen, we had, we had a lot of people that's got a lot of experience with, with these things that, you know, you, you know, I, I, I was, I'm willing to talk to anybody anytime they want to, but you know, we had just kind of a small question and answer. Spencer got me and Troy Allen and Kunbo to sit down and answer questions and talk to people and explain some things. But we had Kane Michael there. I mean, Kane's, you know, a wealth of knowledge. Kane's had lots of experiences. Um, you know, had Eric tipped and just, you know, it would take me, we'd have to be on two more hours for me. I, I'm just, I'm just barely touching. And I apologize to everybody that I'm not mentioning. And it's just due to the time, but you know, Spencer and Misty and, you know, uh, Mark green, flat rock, uh, all these folks showed up and, you know, we had man, pyro medic, pyro come from Oklahoma, but dude, we had people, you know, Dave and DD, they flew from Coos Bay, Oregon, flew to nashville tennessee we had people come from man as far as i know that was the furthest away was david and dd they won the prize for that but man we had 
we had people brought gifts and we had a, a we we drew names out and gave away prizes and stuff but man you know we, it was just phenomenal i mean we me and spencer and misty and like roger squatch and all of roger oh uh, man we were just so overwhelmed we, we talked today for about two hours just how blown away we are at the quality of people that that are that hang out with us and and watch our show you know we try to do a show on sunday uh 1 30 central time uh but we just you know and guys we we just try to be us you know we're we're not we're, we're definitely not professional we're a long way from professional uh we feel like we people need a maybe a, a warning or something before they watch us because we're just us and I, I know we're rough around the edges so but guys we just uh we just that's one thing that we swore for our show we want to be as legitimate and honest and just be us we, we're not you know i i got it you know like when i go back and watch this podcast before long i'll be like i need subtitles you know i really i, I talk nor, northwest alabama and you know, I realize that there'll be a lot of words that I, I, I don't enunciate too well. So y'all bear with me. Give me some slack. So, but, uh, but man, the meet and greet and definitely guys, the way this worked out this year, me and Spencer and Misty are all, there will be a round, there will be a number two. So, but I hate it for anybody that missed it. And we had a lot of people that was there. It was so awesome to meet these folks, shake their hand and, and, Y'all, y'all know who y'all are. I mean, I, I can't name all of you. Y'all, the ones that was there, y'all saw how many was there, and I was absolutely blown away by each and every person that showed up. It was so great to see everybody and anybody that I missed. I wish I hadn't, but maybe before long we'll do something else. And uh, and you've got to drag yourself down to one of these. No, oh, no, definitely we're coming next time. I I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in the cards. This this one I couldn't afford it. Uh, I had two other trips going on, but next year we're definitely coming for one hundred percent. Because a lot of the people that watch your show are here on my show every week. It's just they are they're the salt of the earth. I love them all. I watch oh. your guys show, and you don't have to worry about your accent. You don't have to worry about the way you talk <laughs> on this show. It, no way. It, uh, we have you on here because of your experience and because of your, your, uh, what you do for the Sasquatch community. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. It's not about how you talk. It's not about if you got an accent I love the accents. Um, I have an accent to you. So, you know what I mean? If I come on your guys show, I'll have an accent, you know, and I'll sound funny. So who cares? Yeah. Um, I love all these guys. It's all the same people and, uh, you're exactly right. So next year we're coming, I'm going to bring the Squatch father with me and we're going to come. Hey, hey. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we're going to come down next year. We've already talked about it. So, yeah, so next year. So uh, I want to say a big thank you. I know you just got back from the trip, and you took time out tonight to come on the show, and I really appreciate it. So uh, got any closing words for everybody before we let you go? Same closing words I do on our show. Love all y'all. Big love to everybody. Y'all come hang out with us. All right, well. Hang out backstage for a little bit, and I'll be right back, and uh, uh, we'll chat a little bit more. i got a couple things for you. So thank you so much for taking the time. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the good guys of Sasquatch, Mr. Greg House. All right. All right. All right. What a great show. What a great show. Great guy. So glad we got him on the show. Uh, that's the, the end loop for the Appalachia tour right now. Uh, we'll start it back up in another couple weeks. Uh, next week on the show, we have Utah Sasquatch coming out of retirement for us. Nathan Rio is going to join us. And then after that, I have the makeup show with uh, um, Barb Shoop. So I'm looking forward to that. So, again, a big thank you for everybody who showed up in the chat tonight. You guys are all special to me here at the show. You all, I know you guys, most of you come on on uh, Spencer's show and, and the B show. And uh, I'm glad that you guys you guys have stopped over here and become part of my show. I really do. And uh, I really uh, appreciate each and every one of you every week showing up, taking the time on your Monday nights to uh, stop in. So hope to see you all next week. And as my friend Larry says, get in the woods, people.
I'm trapped inside a fake reality Better days will never come for me